In our previous video, we ended on the summary and conclusion that the glucose molecule that we started with was completely oxidized, and now we can utilize the sort of subproducts that we've created in order to get our ATP from the electron transport chain. We can use those subproducts. And so, just as a side note before we actually begin the flowchart, I just want to give us a scope of what we're talking about. Overall, so far, the key things that have happened are, of course, that glucose has been completely oxidized, but of course, we have to uh, have the idea and understanding that so far we've made four ATP molecules as you go back through the videos. And as you're taking notes, you can actually count all four ATP molecules that have been made um, up until this point. Um, in addition, uh, we've now, what we can say is that all of glucose's um, energy has actually uh, been stored, um, is now stored in the NADH and FADH2 molecules. This is the reason why we were making NADH and FADH2. Glucose had high energy covalent bonds within it that we've converted into NADH and FADH2 molecules that can now be utilized within the electron transport chain. So we can say we use them in ETC, and that's exactly what we're about to do right now. In this next flowchart, we're going to be looking at the electron transport chain and how it works what the point of the NADH and FADH2 um, is so that we can look at the whole idea behind ATP generation through the electron transport chain. So that's just the overall idea that we've established so far. Um, the reason why we've made NADH and FADH2 is because they can be used in the electron transport chain. Let me show you that right now. So let's label the, our next flowchart. It's actually the final step. Oh, it's, oops, let me just put that back. It's actually the um, final step of our uh, cell respiration. So step four would be the electron transport chain. Electron transport chain. This is often referred to as, of course, the ETC. And that's what we'll refer to it from this point forward. Um, this is just uh, a bit of a longer flowchart, so I actually split it into two. So the electron transport chain one flowchart. Um, overall, the electron transport chain can be defined as a series of electron, of course, carriers embedded. And now this is where location is important. Again, we've talked about location many times before in the processes of cell respiration. Series of electron carriers that are embedded in inner mitomembrane, mitochondrial membrane. That's where they are located. And overall, this is a very important function that you have to remember of the electron transport chain. The overall function of this electron transport chain is to transfer electrons from those high energy molecules we created, like NADH, from NADH and FADH2, because they both have electrons that can be given and taken and transfer them to oxygen. This is an overall function of the electron transport chain that you must remember. Transferring electrons from NADH and FADH2 to oxygen. And we'll see what happens to oxygen a little bit later. We mentioned the idea of electron carriers, and it's worth noting what this actually sort of, uh, what this really means, and we'll write that down over here, um, the idea of carriers. What is an electron carrier and how does it play its role in the electron transport chain? Uh, electron carriers, you can mainly consider them, they're usually mainly proteins. Again, they are embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane, so you would expect proteins to be embedded. Um, that These proteins are proteins that can be in both um, an oxidized form and also a reduced form. This will be very important. Because what's going to happen is an electron will be accepted by these proteins and then donated, given away by these proteins. That means if you accept an electron, you gain an electron, these protein would then, this protein would then be in the reduced form because reduction is gain of electrons. But if let's say that carrier gives off that electron to the next carrier, there are many carriers on this chain, that electron carrier would then be in the oxidized form because it gave up an electron, it lost an electron. It has this dual functionality that's very important to its overall function. Um, speaking of passing electrons, we can say that the electron itself um, is uh, pass, it passes down through the ETC 
This is sort of a part of the function. Through um, ETC via uh, redox reactions. And this goes hand in hand with this idea of being in an oxidized form and a reduced form. You cannot do that unless you are undergoing a redox reaction, unless you are undergoing reduction and then oxidation um, almost simultaneously. Uh, what we can also say about this is the idea that NADH and FADH2, remember those are two high energy molecules that for some reason we are making so much of during our previous three steps are finally going to be used because this is going to cause um, energy release um, uh, and most importantly the reason why we have carriers we have separate carriers to hold the energy of the NADH and FADH2 electrons is because the energy release can now become controlled it actually becomes controlled what I mean by this is simply that NADH and FADH2 have very high energy electrons. And remember, we cannot have an electron in a free state. That's part of the whole idea of redox, to have it either in a reduced or an, elect or an oxidative uh, form. So what we have to do is we have to make sure we control its sort of ability to move around this electron transport chain. How do we do that? Utilize redox reactions. That's how we control it. And then lastly, we'll finish up this flowchart by talking about the four carriers themselves. There are four carriers on the electron transport chain, four electron carriers, four major proteins that are embedded on the inner membrane, inner mitochondrial membrane, and let's go through them step by step. They are actually called complexes. The first complex is known as complex 1, and we actually use a Roman numeral to denote them. Complex 1 is going to be the first complex that actually it accepts electrons from NADH. This is why we made NADH. We made NADH because it's going to donate an electron to complex 1 and complex 1 will accept it. Once complex 1 has accepted that electron, it has been in its reduced form. It is then going to go into its oxidized form. It will give and lose that electron by transferring it to ubiquinone. It transfers electron to ubiquinone. Very important molecule. I'm just going to abbreviate it from the letter Q now. So that's all that happens at complex 1. What we do is we have an electron, high energy electron, taken from NADH and transferred to ubiquinone. We'll see why this happens a little bit later. What's the purpose of this transfer? It actually yields energy in, let's say, a, a subconscious way that we haven't seen yet. So we accept and transfer. That's going to be a theme, accept, transfer. So guess what complex 2 is going to do? Complex 2 and ubiquinone, all ubiquinone is is an electron carrier. I'll just write that down, electron carrier on the side. Once a ubiquinone has an electron from NADH, um, it actually has the ability to go to another complex. But it's actually not complex 2. Um, this is where it gets a little confusing. Complex 2 is actually interesting because it actually accepts electrons um, not from NADH, uh, but it actually accepts electrons from FADH2. Accepts electrons from FADH2, and you can already guess. It's very easy to remember that because FADH2 complex 2. Not too hard to remember. Um, and then this is actually also transferred to ubiquinone. Uh, so we'll say it also has the ability and, and transfers to Q, ubiquinone. Then complex 3 gets involved. Complex 3, which is also on this mitochondrial membrane, this inner membrane, complex 3 is going to accept an electron from who? Who do you think? Who's been getting an electron so many times? Obviously, ubiquinone. So ubiquinone will donate this electron, give up its electron, and complex 3 accepts electron from Q. But once again, it's all about accepting and transferring. Accept and transfer. It's all about reduction, oxidation. This is going to give us energy in a way that we'll see in just a second. So once we've accepted an electron from ubiquinone, we actually have to transfer it. And it transfers specifically to what is known as cytochrome C. I would know the points at which electrons are accepted and from who and where they're transferred to. It's just important to give us an idea of the actual process. So I think it's important to actually remember that NADH um, goes to complex 1, FADH2 goes to complex 2, and then both of them give uh, their electron to ubiquinone, and ubiquinone gives that electron to cytochrome C. And then I'll tell you that complex 4, of course, is now going to get into the equation. Complex 4. Complex 4, it actually accepts 
electrons from guess who? From cytochrome C, so I'll just write cyto C. And it finally, this is the most important part of the electron transport chain. If you're going to remember one thing about the electron transport chain, remember that complex 4 uses the electrons accepted from cytochrome C, and it uses them to reduce O2 to H2O. This is the most important fact about the electron transport chain that you must absolutely remember because this is the reason we breathe oxygen. We breathe oxygen because it is the final electron acceptor that will then turn into H2O. If you go back to our cellular respiration equation, remember we breathe in O2 and obviously we breathe out CO2, but guess what else we make out of cellular respiration? H2O. This is why. So overall, this is an introduction to our electron transport chain. We understand that it's a series of electron carriers. The electron passes down through the electron transport chain um, through the redox reaction process, and we have four carriers. We have complex one, complex two, complex three, and complex four. Each of them is responsible for accepting and then transferring electrons, accepting and transferring, accepting and transferring. And this is all done in order to yield a proton gradient, which is something I'll talk about in the next video.